Um, very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Mary, uh, Mary Fulbrook, um, uh, who's um, going to give us her, her, her lecture entitled Oblivion and Memorialization, the Legacies of Na Nazi uh, Persecution in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm um, very honoured to be giving a lecture on the occasion of the week which sees Holocaust Memorial Day. And so it's a little bit different from the usual kind of academic lecture because I'm very conscious of the fact that by giving this lecture about this topic this week, I'm also in some senses, and you too as, as the people gathered here to discuss and think about these things, are engaging ourselves in an act of memorialization. So it's, it's a rather curious combination of trying to understand what has been going on with memorialization in Europe since the end of the Second World War and ourselves also engaging in thinking about that past, thinking about our own relationship with that past. So I'm going to start by um, raising some questions. Uh, I've got a slight problem in that this hasn't come up completely for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. It's a Mac going into a PC system. But I'm going to start um, by raising some questions between the balance between remembrance and oblivion. Now, why that is not coming up, I have no idea. I'll just move on from the questions to the pictures, which are more interesting anyway. I want to talk about the balance between remembrance and oblivion. Um, what is it that we remember? Who is it that we remember? How do we remember? And at the expense of what other people, groups, which traces have been lost, which have been marginalised? Um, and what are the hidden legacies among people when we look at certain things at the expense of other things? I'll start by looking at iconic sites. And I guess you all think of Auschwitz immediately when you think about Holocaust remembrance. Um, the famous gates with Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free, that hideous slogan, because of course it was Vernichtung durch Arbeit, um, extermination through work. Those who were lucky enough not to be selected instantly for the gas chambers had an average life expectancy when they'd been selected for work of three months. So if you were on the ramp with Mengele and you were sent not to the one side to go to the gas chambers but the other side to work, your average life expectancy was three months. It was extermination through labour. That said, the vast majority of survivors of Auschwitz were those who had been sent to work camps. They had a, a, a higher chance of survival, not great, but a higher chance of survival. This on the right is the original gas chamber in Auschwitz I, the main camp. We tend to think of the crematoria and the gas chambers of Birkenau, but that was the very first gas chamber. <coughs> Auschwitz raises questions about how we treat iconic sites of memory. We sort of think this is an authentic site, this is where it happened. If we go there, we are standing on the sacred spot where things really happened, and we sort of feel we can have a direct access to the past. In a, I'm not quite sure if it's a mystical way, but it always surprises me just what an impression it makes when you physically stand in a place where you know things happened through time long ago, but in the same place that you're standing now. So there is this sense that you are in a very sacred place in some way, but that doesn't necessarily make it a place where you can easily learn about the past as it really was. Because these sites of memory, even the iconic sites, the authentic sites, do not portray for the casual visitor how it really was at any given point in time. And of course, all these sites changed massively over time themselves. You think about Auschwitz itself, building up, developing the apparatus of extermination, expanding, bringing in more prisoners, killing more prisoners. We tend to imagine it as in the summer of 1944, simply because that's when the Hungarian transports came in and some SS officer took a lot of photographs of them. So the iconic photographs that we think about tend to be at the height of extermination, the extermination of the Hungarian Jews in the summer of 1944. But it wasn't like that for everyone. Each experience is different at different times. <laughs> so what are we doing when we look at things? The Lake of Sorrows, that is horribly sad when you stand there. That is where ashes were thrown of people who had been cremated, whose bodies had been burned, and the ashes were thrown. And those are the trees behind where people, in some of the photos you see, 
You see people who had been forced to undress or who were just undressing, leaving their clothes in piles, waiting to go to the gas chambers. So when you stand on that ground there, it, it's very different now. It's a place of sadness, a place of contemplation. It's not how it was, and thank goodness it's not how it was, but we can't even begin to understand or imagine or reproduce how it was. Similarly, on the right, you see a very nice French memorial on the so-called ramp. Um, slight problem, the bit of train tracks they built there was not the ramp. It was not the ramp where people were originally unloaded. Neither was it the ramp in Birkenau itself through the iconic gates, nor was it the ramp down at the railway station just on siding where people were actually unloaded. So you go there and you think, I want to imagine to myself, what did it feel like? The truck stood there, the people, you know, all the accounts you read of survivors where you get survivor guilt, someone saying, I shouldn't have told my baby brother, go with mummy, she'll look after you, because the last I saw of him was he was thrown on the truck with mummy and they went straight off to the gas chambers. You stand on this ramp and you, you're imagining these stories and then you think, hey, but this wasn't where it was. Or if you're a historian, you know it wasn't where it was. If you're a tourist, you might think it was. So even authentic sites are not 100% perfectly authentic. There are also problems of preservation. Um, Things like these suitcases with names on, you know the people who packed them were hoping and believing against all the evidence that they were really resettling in the East. They were hoodwinked into believing that, told they could take so and so many kilograms, bring a blanket, bring a spade, you're digging up, resettling. It's so sad to see them, but they're getting really grubby, really old, decaying. Should Auschwitz Museum be preserving them now? Should they be treating them? Similarly, the hair we have here, photograph I took several years ago where it was still looking quite golden that plait but the hair is decaying and, and going grey the shoes are all looking very grey and grubby we're getting more and more of a sense of distance rather than the immediacy that you have when you go there and you look at those shoes and you think all those people who wore those shoes little children's shoes who never grew up you know that sense of immediacy these are real people that sort of peters away over time when it begins to look like a rubbish dump of old shoes that of course you'd chuck away. So the real issues about what do you do about preservation when you want authenticity and who pays for presentation, uh, preservation? Should it be the Polish government because it's on Polish soil or should the German government pay a vast amount more than it is to the preservation of these sites in Poland because it was a German responsibility and indeed Auschwitz itself was in the borders of the Greater German Reich at the time. Um, or should current German taxpayers not really have to worry about it because it isn't the young people of today, the middle aged of today, who had anything to do with that Nazi past anymore. We're talking two, three generations back now. So there are questions about how do you sustain authenticity or should you not? Now I'm very much hoping this will come up. Yep. Why are some sites iconic? Why has Auschwitz concentrated all our attention? It's interesting that some sites have become national shrines because they work for a particular government, a particular regime at a particular time. If you go to what is now the eastern part of United Germany, formerly the GDR, you'll find Buchenwald, where communist leader Ernst Thälmann was murdered by the Nazis. It was a national shrine for the GDR for 40 years. Hordes of young people were sent there. So it had a lot of attention. Other places didn't. Um, transport links. I don't know how many of you look at cheap flights to Krakow, lovely tourist destination. Um, as Luton Airport used to have it, you get a lottie for your slotty. <laughs> as you're going into the departures bit, the, the security section, I will, I will saw that, you get a lottie for yours, lottie. Um, so lovely to go to Krakow. And then you get these three-day trips being advertised in the Sunday newspapers saying, OK, salt mines, Vavel, day trip to Auschwitz, and back again. You don't have to stay a night in that ghastly town unless you're doing research or going to a conference, as my colleague here in the front know, row knows. Um, it, so it, good transport links. This is not true, for example, of Sobibor or Belgets. Sobibor, you have to be really determined to drive around the most ghastly Eastern Polish roads to even find it. Um, Well-preserved, authentic and visible remains. Belgets did not have really anything to be seen, but the USHMM, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, decided to put a fantastic memorial there so that you can go to it for the museum and for the memorial and remember this is the place, but you can't see how the place looked. So it's not quite an iconic site of memory. 
powerful agents of memory, this is very important. If you look at any kind of pattern of memorialization, there's always a contest <coughs> between different groups with different interests. For decades after the war, the interests of most Germans were in kicking over the traces, and it was only a few survivors who wanted to go back and mark the area of their suffering or mark the area where their relatives were murdered. Suddenly, memorialization, certainly since the 1990s, has become a huge topic, a huge issue. I think David Cameron even this week has said something about should we have a permanent Holocaust memorial and not just a Holocaust garden in Hyde Park. So it's, it's changed. Um, the thing that I'm particularly interested in is this issue of what I call communities of connection and identification. People who have a close connection with a particular past, the child of survivors, for example, intricately, intimately, inescapably connected with that past. And people who strongly identify with a particular past, perhaps an Israeli Jew who feels that by virtue of being Jewish and Israeli, they must have a connection with the Holocaust. Um, sometimes these things are quite complex. Children of perpetrators identifying strongly with the victims. I'll come back to that. <laughs> sometimes they're quite complex in another way. Homosexual men who did not themselves have children nevertheless have a community of identification of later homosexual men who feel in some way also addressed by the persecution of homosexual men in the Third Reich. So there are communities of connection and identification who have interests in ensuring their group is in some way memorialized. Why Auschwitz then is very easy because many, many nationalities were sent to Auschwitz. It had many different reasons for being a prisoner, political prisoners, Polish prisoners, communists, others, um, religious prisoners and prisoners on racial grounds. I put that in inverted commas because of the, all the sensitivities surrounding the Nazi definition of race and distinguishing between races. And be, despite the fact that it had the highest single number of deaths, somewhat over one million, of any of the dedicated sites of extermination, it also had an extraordinarily high number of survivors because of the work camps, the labour camps, the selection for work and so on. So key individuals who were survivors could write their memoirs, could write their testimonies, and could work to try and track down perpetrators. I turn now to unvisited sites, Shelm though. Um, in a sense, it's quite the opposite. It's totally off the beaten track. You have to hire a car and find it, and it's not even that easy, because if you get a Polish car with a GPS system and you write in Chelmno, it sends you to somewhere completely different in Poland, which has the same name. And if you put Chelmno sur on the on the Nair River, um, it still doesn't find it, so you have to put in somewhere else. It's extraordinarily difficult to find, even for the dedicated historian who's determined to get there. It is really deserted, and yet it's got an incredibly important historical role. It was the site where the first in situ gassing of the Holocaust proper took place after the euthanasia program. I'll come back to euthanasia in a moment. But it was the first site where they thought, OK, instead of going to find the victims and shooting them into graves where we find them, we will bring the victims to us and kill them more efficiently in a way with a bit of distance between the perpetrator and, and the victim, not having to shoot someone you can see, but shoving them in the back of a van, shutting the doors and sending them off with the exhaust fumes turned into the van. So it's a really important place. And yet it's barely memorialised. It's very personalised memorials, um, communities of connection and identification again, families. The one on the far left there, which you will barely be able to see for good reasons, is such a sad little memorial. It's somebody whose baby sister, who's, I think she was six, the sister, was taken away from the Wutch ghetto and gassed in Shelm though. And it's the elder sister who clearly had very little money to pay for much of a memorial, but wanted some little memento, some little plaque. And that wall that you see up there is full of these things. This is Israeli scouts, community of identification with young people then, scouts today. That's a family, and as I say, that's a very personal one. Um, memorialization. I, I, I say we are engaged today in the collective act of memorialization. So I've put in here one of the very, very few pieces of what I suppose you could call testimony that recounts the fate of the gypsies who were gassed, taken from the Wutch ghetto and gassed in Chelmno. 
This is by a guy called Shlamek. He's one of only six or seven people, only six or seven people, the number is not even completely agreed upon, managed to escape from Shalm, though. He's one of that half dozen who escaped, but he didn't survive the war. He got first of all to the Warsaw Ghetto, told his story to the people in the Warsaw Ghetto who are writing down these things. That's how we have an account of his testimony. He then managed to get down to Zamosh to relatives, but he was caught there and murdered. Um, and this is what he says within weeks of witnessing this, because he was one of the Jewish workers in, in Shalm, though, and he talks about the, the way in which the bodies of the gas gypsies fell out of the back of the gas van when they were to be put in the grave lying in their own excrements, their bodies entangled, the bodies were still warm, so the pit workers warmed themselves up, staying close to them. After the van had left and the corpses had been placed in the graves, the pit workers put on colourful gypsy clothes and sat down on the dead bodies in the graves. The eight pit, wor pit workers were not allowed to leave the grave. They were told to lie down on the corpses of the gypsies with their faces down. A gendarme killed them with a submachine gun. Now, Jlamek's account, written, recounted about eight weeks or so after he had escaped, after he had witnessed these events, it's one of the closest accounts we have to the experiences of those people who are working there. The pit workers didn't survive to talk about it. Most of the people who were engaged, like Jlamek, in, in assisting this operation did not survive. It's extraordinary that we have something like that. Um, marginalised and neglected sites, there are all over Poland and indeed all over Europe, sites where ghastly things happened. I'm just taking one, which could stand for many, Mielets. Um, the first major deportations to Belgets took there, the first major deportation in the general government under Hans Frank. Um, so again, quite historically significant, and yet I bet the vast majority of you in this room who are not professionally concerned with this topic will have heard of Auschwitz, probably heard of Shalm, though will never have heard of Mielets, and you probably never will again, um, because it really is just one of many, many towns. The town square, where they were rounded up and deported, does not have a plaque, no memorial whatsoever. The place where the synagogue was has in the top there that stone, on the back of which, as you can see here, is a swastika painted the wrong way round by some local Polish anti-Semitic job of some sort, I don't know, but they hadn't bothered to paint it out. And some families of those who were deported and murdered bought a plot in a nearby housing estate a little way out of town and put up a general memorial and a couple of family kind of gravestone memorials that you can see in the middle picture there. But again, it's just those who are connected with those who died on that site. There was a concentration camp, which was quite significant in Mielets, a, a little one, a work labour camp, but a lot of people were taken out from it and murdered or taken away to Belgets and elsewhere. It's still um, an aircraft factory. I went there using my best Polish, which is pretty basic, despite the best efforts of cease Polish teachers, and tried to explain to them what I was looking for. They had no idea there was a memorial on their site. And so we wandered around all this ghastly landscape, Vaga means, you know, watch out, Achtung, be careful. We wandered around all over the place. We finally found this solitary little stone, but they had no idea that they'd had a concentration camp on their site. And, that, and then when I talked to the woman afterwards who had been showing us around, she said, well, the previous Sunday she'd been with her father and her daughter for a walk in the local woods, and her father, who'd been a young man at the time of the Nazi occupation, had shown them in the woods the site of the mass graves where hundreds of Jews were buried, unmarked, but he wanted his granddaughter, her daughter, to know where it was. So in folk, local folk Polish memory, they say, this bit of the woods, a bit creepy, this is the mass grave. But there's no, no marking of it. It will disappear when that disappears. And it's curiously related to something else, very close by is this former German colony of Volksdeutsche, Hohenbach, where they have just in 2012 put up this nice Polish-German reconciliation, beautifully tended memorial, despite the fact that all the German graves are thrown over like that. At the expense, this reconciliation between the Poles and the Germans, at the expense of remembering what the Volksdeutsche, the, the Polish-German ethnic group there, had done in 1942, one of the graves is the Zimmermann family, one of the Zimmermanns was a young Gestapo man who was highly involved in the deportations and the shootings. He landed up in East Germany after the war and was sentenced to life imprisonment. He was a, an 18-year-old, illiterate pretty much. 
obeyed orders, um, sentenced to life imprisonment in the, t in the GDR. His two bosses, the two chiefs of the Gestapo headquarters who had ordered him to do this stuff, landed up in West Germany. One is never brought to court. The other is brought to court and given a relatively lenient sentence. So post-war justice really didn't map very cleverly onto what was happening at the time. But the point is here, you know, we can have Polish-German reconciliation if you ignore all that. Marginalised victims and taboos. I've mentioned the, um, the Nazi so-called euthanasia programme. From 39 to 41, it was in full swing. Then Germans noticed that something was wrong, started protesting. Hitler pulled it back. People went on being murdered in institutions for the physically and mentally disabled throughout the war, but the official major programme was terminated in the summer of 41. Sites all over Germany, as you can see from the map. Virtually no memorial. This is on the ground just back of the Philharmonia in Berlin in the cultural forum area. Um, that some of you may know with the new National Gallery and so on, just south of the Tiergarten. It's on the ground. You have to pull the leaves away to even take a photograph of it. Nobody knows there's even a euthanasia memorial there. And it's something which people feel very um, sensitive about still. Most families, when you read family accounts, try very hard to forget their little three-year-old who they'd left in a clinic. And three weeks later, when they came back, their daughter was half starving. And then a couple of days later, they received the death notice. It's too painful to remember. Or their uncle, who was a little bit schwachsinnig, as they like to say, a little bit feeble-minded, and who then died of pneumonia when umpteen others in the same institution all died at the same time. They like to forget that. They're very, and research shows that many German families, right through the late 20th century, felt there was a stigma attached, that if it was hereditary, perhaps they too perhaps carried some you know, genetic defect. So euthanasia is very late in terms of memorialization. Um, the gypsies, as they were called by the Nazis, the Roma and Zinti, it's a bit disputed what we should best call them. There is a nice memorial to them in the Wutsch ghetto. You can see it's tucked away in a rather unpleasant communist housing estate on the left. You can see this, but it's actually quite nicely preserved. Homosexual victims, extraordinarily late to be recognised um, because it was still a criminal offence. And it is so sad that when this was opened in 2008, the last surviving homosexual victim of Nazi persecution had died three years earlier. So there was no survivor of that particular wave of persecution to come and see the opening of that memorial in the Tiergarten. Mollendorfplatz was quite early, 1989. There were others in the 1980s. But this group of victims of Nazi persecution, very delayed recognition, I think, and still stigmatised. If you look at a film called Paragraph 175, you will find the very small handful of survivors saying how they were too ashamed even to tell, in one case, to tell his mother she would have felt so bad why it was he'd been imprisoned and how hatefully he was treated even after the war when he came out, still stigmatised and excluded. Um, this is quite interesting. Ravensbrück, the women's camp, was in the former GDR. A lot of official memorialization. In 1987, there was something called the Olaf Palmer Peace March, which was officially permitted in the GDR. And in the middle of it, there were unofficial banners of a group of lesbians, East German lesbians, who said, we want to memorialize the victims of persecution of homosexual people under Nazism. And they managed to carry their banners for a little bit of the way. Um, I met one of them, in fact, who was over here at UCL as a student in around 1990 and talked about her experiences. And I've written about that a little bit, but I was so pleased when I went recently and saw in the exhibition, this is an extract from a visitor's book, which was immediately <coughs> confiscated when these women wrote this down in 1986, but it's now on display in the exhibition, which says, we're thinking of the suffering, we're, we, um, we are thinking, we are holding in our thoughts the suffering of the victims of fascism and particularly of the homosexual women. And I, I I, I'm really glad that's been brought out again and has been put on display there. Um, so let me just look at some more general issues um, about how we live with this extraordinarily difficult past and, and what we should be doing about it. 
Uh, if you look at what I might call perpetrator communities, children of parents who are Nazis in one, at one level or another, in one form or another, and I'm not talking here only about people shooting Jews into ditches on the Eastern Front or people in SS uniform, I'm talking about people who sustained the system, who were civil servants, who were um, practicing in one form or another a profession in which they were excluding others on grounds of the newly introduced categories of exclusion, humiliation, degradation, and ultimately death. What happens in the families, it's not collective amnesia, it's not that the past is not talked about, it is, but in ways that render that past harmless. You can read accounts where there are tales of bravery, of courage, of suffering of your comrades, but not of victims. Um, oral historians talk about biographical repair strategies. If you live through radical, sudden changes of regime, you're living under Nazism, and then you're living under democracy or under communism, you have to account for those acts, those things you've done that you can't dispute. But in terms of a different moral framework, a different system of values, and so you somehow patch up your biography and you say, OK, well, I was in the Nazi party, but only because it was to protect my family or only because I wanted to work against Nazism from within, etc. Um, many people, even perpetrators, portray themselves as victims in some way. They were called up. They didn't want to join the SS. Or they did want to join the SS because they were idealistic. They'd been brought up as a young Nazi, and then only later realised what this meant. Victims of war, we suffered too. All the people who were expelled from the Germans who were expellees and refugees at the end of the war. And a very interesting set of things goes on, self-distancing from the sight of real evil. You've probably, all of you, come across that phrase among Germans, we never knew anything about it. If you unpack that and look at it in narratives, it always is just a little bit away from where you are. So if you're in Hamburg, it is Auschwitz, far away. If you're in somewhere in Silesia, it is in Auschwitz, 40 kilometers away. If you are working, as one woman whose memoirs I've read was doing, as a school teacher in the town of Auschwitz, Ostfienschim, and who is teaching Rudolf Husser's children, the children of the commandant of Auschwitz, she couldn't know anything about it because it was the other side of the perimeter fence and she couldn't cross the perimeter fence. She couldn't really know. OK, so the furniture was covered with ashes one day and the landlady whispered, might be that the wind's coming from the wrong direction. They're burning bodies again, but you couldn't really know. So this self-distancing so that had you really known, you might have done something, but because you were ignorant, you must be innocent. That's very common in the perpetrator communities. Survivor communities, there are all sorts of other things going on. Living with trauma, many, many survivors, even though they appear to be fantastically well-functioning, well-integrated, superb post-war adults, have a sense that they are in some way split. Split self, previous self, later self, something inside that they can't communicate. There are scars. I can't even begin to go into that literature. It's an enormous literature. Um, not talking because they want, in some respects, many talk incessantly, others don't talk at all, and very often because they say things like, the Nazis ruined my youth, why should I ruin that of my children as well? Try to make new lives, build new lives, let the children have happy childhoods, but nevertheless with implications. Portraying themselves not so much as victims, interesting perpetrators portray self as victim without agency. Survivors very often try and find agency and feel guilt because they didn't exercise it. The not, you should not have told your baby brother to go with the mother, that, that story, I think. The agency that you had, you misused, so you feel guilty. So portray yourself as a fighter, as a survivor. Variations depending on where you land up. People talk very much in terms of the host community. Israel is very different from New York, it's very different from London, it's very different from West Germany or from France. So there are huge historical variations. Also self-distancing strategies. Very interesting when you read very late memoirs and people reveal what they hadn't dared to say over half a lifetime. Um, 
one that came out recently talks about how it was the first time he'd ever told anybody, including his children and grandchildren, just how sweet a lump of sugar tasted the first Christmas after the war and he first tasted a lump of sugar. It was too precious a memory, he didn't want to share it. So things from those tiny little, what do you retain, that's your own authentic life memory, to the huge, big, awful things that you don't want to talk about because they're too painful. Um, then we get to this question of identification of and with victims. Obsessive memorialization. I think it can be argued, and I've had this argument several times, um, so I know it can be argued, and I'm not quite sure where I end up on it, uh, that currently Germany, and particularly Berlin, is engaging in memorialization beyond all bounds of what might be deemed to be I don't know what, I mean, I can't even think what the adjective would be that I would want here. But this Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, I'm sure many of you have been to it or seen photos of it, vast expanse, acreage and prime real estate territory, right by the Brandenburg Gate, right in the centre of Berlin. Um, this huge landscape of almost coffin-like stelae, as they're called, on the one hand, abstract memorial. On the other hand, these tiny little stumbling stones in the pavement, Stolpersteine, which I really like because they identify individual victims with the name, the date of birth, the date of deportation, the date and place of death, if it's known. These are, in one sense, and I say this is not an academic lecture in a sense because it's Memorial, it's Holocaust Memorial Day, and so we are sort of morally eva evaluating these things rather than just analysing them dryly. So I'll tell you what I think. Uh, I like the Stolpersteiner. I think this is a really nice reminder of each individual. It cannot bring them back, but it can tell you that in this street, let's say Belziger Straße in Schoenberg, 27 people were taken from these three houses in broad daylight and bunged on the back of a truck, and their neighbours were looking out from all the windows around, not lifting a finger. Um, so it can bring it back to you what this meant in a particular community. But I have a problem which is the following, and I've tried to intimate it up there. Um, we say, many people say, oh, Germany has done a good job of overcoming its past, coming to terms with its past, contrast Vienna next to nothing, not even a plaque where Eichmann had his offices, um, just a small Holocaust memorial compared to this. But at whose expense? If you look at justice, we think Auschwitz trials, fantastic early to mid-60s in West Germany, major trials bringing it to public attention straight after the Eichmann trial. Who was behind the Eichmann trial and the Auschwitz trials? Not the great West German government with all the ex-Nazis in high places, but Fritz Bauer, Attorney General of the Land of Hesse, um, himself Jewish, socialist, homosexual, determined to bring some Nazis to trial. How many did he bring to trial? 22. How many worked in Auschwitz in one capacity or another as a persecutor during the period of its activities? Most people, when I ask that question, don't have a clue. They usually land up and say a few hundred, maybe, so 22 isn't that many. Difficult to get the exact number because some people moved on, went to the front, other, they were replaced, so it's not the number of roles, but the total number of individuals. Somewhere between 6,000 and 8,000 were involved in making our Auschwitz function, of whom 22 were brought to trial there, and maybe a couple of dozen others in other trials. But it's pathetic, the numbers who were brought to, to justice. So reintegration of former Nazis, and yet massive identification with the victims. Uh, you can argue that it's stabilization, it's good for stability to reintegrate. So in place of conclusions, I land up still with some questions. Um, let me just tell you about Cardave first. Uh, that is a big department store in the 30s under Jewish ownership, Aryanized by the Nazis. Cardave stands for Kaufhof des Westens, the department store of the West. In the Cold War period, fantastic symbol of West Berlin, prosperity, capitalism, consumerism, materialism, so in front of it, one of those very typical things that you get. Um, a list of places of terror that we are never allowed to forget. Orte des Schreckens, die wir nie vergessen dürfen. We are never allowed to forget, that we may never forget. And then a list of concentration camps. So you come out of Wittenbergplatz, U-Bahn station, and you see that. 
that, that contrast. So that is contemporary Germany. Now, what do we make of all this on Holocaust Memorial Day? Representation. I think that the landscapes of the past that represent that past to the casual tourists today do not represent that past. Whether it's because they're not quite authentic, as I've indicated with Auschwitz, even where you have huge amount of authentic remains, it's difficult to decide between preservation and neglect, let the crematoria fall in, let them tumble into ruins, or do you try and recreate something? There's a problem of representation. But I think one of the problems that we don't often notice is the failure to point the finger at the perpetrators. We commemorate the victims, but who was doing it? Conrad Adenauer, the first West German Chancellor after the war, had this wonderful statement saying uh, things that were done in the name of the Germans, but it's all in the passive tense against the Jewish people. No one's actually doing it. So there's this kind of Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, Goering, all the big ones, Heydrich, etc. Uh, they were the perpetrators, and then a few SS people and a few criminals, but the vast mass of those who were involved in sustaining the system and doing it disappear from the representation of this past. Education, um, again, I've argued this one round and round in my head. I can't quite come to a conclusion on it. When I last had the argument about the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, that vast field of steelite, there is an educational exhibition that underground. It brings home very vividly the fates of individual victims, individual families. But again, the perpetrators are just SS men in uniforms, no personalization of it. Should we do more in education to understand the vast majority of perpetrators, the variety of collaborators and facilitators? Remembrance, I get worried that if we engage too much in genuflection, that we should never forget so it never happens again, that we don't actually think hard enough. And so I hope that our acts of memorialization, remembrance, actually also make us think about what does it mean for the present, the future, and how could we be doing this better? And I think one of the interesting things is the question of the cycle of mourning and then moving on. Um, memory and amnesia, they're in a balance. You sometimes have to not think about the pain of the past or you can't function in the present. That doesn't mean you're arguing repression or sweeping aside, but you have to think of moving on. And when I talk about generations and future landscapes of joy, uh, I, this was put to me very forcibly once when I was shocked at a Polish town where there were simply no memorials at all. And the guy showing me around from the city council said, um, yeah, but these people living here today, they had nothing to do with it. They want to live their lives, not live in a town full of ghosts. So we've got to think about the future too. Can we concentrate even more on iconic sites and concentrate more on education in a wider sense and somehow move on in some way? So I'll just leave you with these questions. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mary. Um, it begs all sorts of questions. I'm afraid we've only got a, uh, about a minute or so left, um, so perhaps I could open it up just for, just for one question. Uh, may I ask, uh, how does this compare with, say, the memorialization of the British Boer War concentration camps? <laughs> this is massive. That's ne uh, negligible, I think, yep. is the simple answer. But the, the point is really that um, the German commemoration has become a huge part of the identity of the Federal Republic of Germany, this sense of special responsibility for the past and a heightened moral responsibility in the present, which I guess is a good thing. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for readdressing for us the question of why do we remember, and therefore what and, and what do we remember and how. Um, uh, a lot to think about there. And thank you very much for a very interesting lecture, Mary. Um, I wish you could join me in thanking her. Thank you. Thank you.